Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. This is your host, Darren. And I can't believe it's already August 9th, 2013. For those of you who are still struggling to figure out which schools to apply to, which schools fit you best, which schools you have a chance of getting into, I can help out. Go to touchmba.com, tell me a little bit about yourself, and I can help you drop a short list of schools that matches your profile and your career goals and give you a kickstart Uh, on your school selection and research process and I really just want to match you up with schools that will change your life and that you'll be excited about. So go ahead over to touchmba.com and click on get school selection help and I look forward to meeting you. This week we spoke to Dr. Yoshi Fujikawa from the Hitosubashi ICS MBA program in Tokyo, Japan. Now when most of us think about business education and MBAs, we rarely think about Japan, even though it's the third largest economy in the world. And that's why I think this week's conversation is so interesting, because what this program does is give its participants the quote unquote best of two worlds. They really try to pass the knowledge of what Japanese companies have really excelled at Areas such as operations management, innovation management, um, knowledge management, and expose their students to industries that Japan is at the forefront of, such as street fashion, manga, anime. Um, And they do all these things while giving uh, their participants an education on par with the best Western MBA programs. So I had a really in-depth discussion with Professor Yoshi, and I'm going to split this podcast into two parts. Part one focuses on what makes the program unique and how MBAs are viewed in Japan. Part two will focus on admissions questions, financing questions, and career prospect questions for international candidates in Japan. So let's get started. Welcome, friends, to the Touch MBA podcast. This is your host, Darren, uh, and I'm really excited to have our next guest on the show. I think it's going to be a really interesting podcast. Um, I'd like to welcome Professor Yoshi Fujikawa, who is the Associate Professor of International Business Strategy and the Faculty Director of the Hitosubashi University ICS MBA program, which is based in Tokyo, Japan. And... Professor Yoshi has a really interesting background. He got both his bachelor's and master's degrees from Hito Tsubashi, but then went west and got his MBA from from Harvard Business School and then his PhD from Penn State, uh, where he taught before coming back to Tokyo to teach at the Hito Tsubashi University ICS MBA program. So I think he has a really interesting background to share uh, about business education in Japan uh, versus the US. And I'm really excited for this show. So welcome to the show, uh, Professor Yoshi. Thank you very much, Darren. Thank you for having me. Great. So what makes the Hito Tsubashi ICS MBA unique? Sure. Well, our MBA program or our school, uh, by the way, uh, we call ourselves as the Hitotsubashi ICS. ICS stands for International Corporate Strategy, and that's part of our school's name, Graduate School of International Corporate Strategy. And we're the part of Hitotsubashi University. And uh, we are one of the very few um, MBA programs which is run completely in English in Japan. And uh, Hitotsubashi itself uh, was found in 1875, so more than 135 years ago. Uh, But our Graduate School of International Corporate Strategy uh, was founded in year 2000. So we are one of the uh, newest addition to this one of the uh, probably the oldest uh, national university uh, in Japan. 
And Hitotsubashi itself has been known for uh, the university, which has been specializing in itself in uh, social sciences, including business management, econ, law, and, and the social studies. And, but our school was founded as the uh, professional school, just as is the case with the other top uh, level uh, business schools around the world. And so uh, we are offering MBA program as well as a DBA program at, uh, as part of uh, our graduate school. And so, so we are the one of the very few, the English run uh, program in Tokyo, in Japan. And one of the unique feature of a program uh, is what we call the best of two worlds. And we are very much well aware uh, that we are entering this business school community or business school market or business school industry, if you will, after more than probably 100 years when that the first set of the business schools was founded as elsewhere around the world. And uh, given that understanding uh, that we try to differentiate ourselves from doing two things. First, to establish, develop, and run uh, the program that is the uh, uh, that can be called truly world class, and for that, uh, we are trying to incorporate as much as possible what has been already known as the uh, MBA program in the world, and so we have uh, those required core courses ranging from marketing to strategy to organization behaviors to finance to accounting to, you know, what not, to name a few. And, but at the same time, we try to include, we try to uh, bring in uh, something that uh, we, as, you know, Japan uh, have to offer when it comes to management education. So as part of our program that we are uh, offering, uh, for example, course such as knowledge management and knowledge theory as part of the required part of the uh, program, but as, uh, on the, as well as the innovation management and then also operations management. And those are the areas that the Japanese company have been studied and it has been well known uh, for. And so those are the courses uh, that were also uh, listed together with the uh, other typical like, you know, courses that you can find in other MBA program. And so that's, that's one of those you know, best of two worlds concept, like an east-west kind of combination. But at the same time, we are also trying to incorporate as part of our curriculum that uh, this contrast between large versus small, like in you know, large companies and small entrepreneurial companies, global versus local, and old established industries versus new emerging, you know, the companies and also economy, practice and theory, cooperation and competition, in a business and society, like you know, those uh, people who are typically called haves, as well as those people who are unfortunately are in a society like you know, facing a lot of difficulties and challenges, and so, so those have-nots. And so we are trying to incorporate uh, this whole value uh, system of embracing those you know, two opposing uh, forces, not as the uh, dichotomies, but more as the things that we want to come up with, the way to strike the balance uh, between the two. So that's, uh, so that's another aspect of our program. One last thing that I want to add to this first question uh, is this being, us being the uh, quite small program uh, as an MBA uh, program. We, every year we are accepting somewhere between 50 to 60 students. And they are actually very diverse, that every year we are welcoming students uh, coming from uh, close to, if not more than, uh, 20 different countries around the world. And uh, our faculty members to student ratio is somewhere between one to three to one to four. And, and so uh, the students themselves get to know with them, uh, with each other very well. But at the same time, our students and our faculty members uh, get to know with each other very well. And later on, I'm going to describe, ex explain the system that we employ, which is called the seminar system. 
that uh, uh, through this seminar system that uh, faculty and uh, students that interact not just within the uh, classroom but also outside the classroom in the social functions and, and, and things. And so once that the relation is established and, and bonded uh, while they are in the program, that interactions and relations actually continue going on even after they leave the program as, as the alumni members. And so that's another thing that we are actually proud of. Wow. So, yeah, a lot to get into. And you mentioned this concept, best of two worlds. And, yes. And, you know, I think you have a great experience because you've gone through the, uh, Hito Subashi and as well as schools like Penn State and Harvard. So um, what do you think international MBA students can learn by coming to Japan and learning about management in Japan? Yes, there, there's a couple of things that I want to point out here that especially, you know, based on my own experience, if you go to like, you know, bigger schools, let, let's say in the States uh, or in Europe and probably more so in the States, that you will get a lot of like exposure and then also a lot of experiences on being successful and how to become like a successful business leaders and in terms of like you know managing and then also acting in 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 the uh, let's say american business uh context and uh, myself uh was i i was there in an mba program you know i was one of the uh, very big program at harvard business school uh, more than 900 close to 1000 students in 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 each year and you are rather as a minority uh, there as being international students. And let's say 20, 30 percent of the, uh, this big schools and international students. And then most of these international students are pretty much Americanized, like, you know, they are uh, international students. And uh, whereas if you come to the program like ours, like you put yourself in uh, what we call the truly international kind of context uh, that in which that uh, you will interact with 50 plus students from 20 different countries and majority of them are speaking English as a second language, which is more sort of a context in which that more typically that you find yourself after you finish your MBA program, that as you are pursuing your career, in uh, this part of the world. And so that how you are going to take the leadership role, for example, or how to lead the uh, discussion or how to impact the direction of the discussion, let's say, with those people coming from like, you know, different countries in the context in which that uh, you are uh, successfully like, you know, the uh, act yourself and making yourself uh, clear among those people uh, coming from those, you know, background. And so, and, and then rather than being the, uh, uh, like, you know, minor minority international uh, student group in a big school, that the, you're here as sort of like um, uh, have the, a lot of like opportunity that you find yourself of, of, of actually taking the lead and uh, taking the uh, uh, initiative. In, in the program. So you're, you're no longer like a, one of those very quiet international uh, minority group in a very small group, uh, in, in a very big school, that you're the one of the uh, main player uh, in this, you know, the truly international, you know, the learning context that we can offer in Tokyo. That, that's one thing. Going back to your original question that uh, what they can get if they uh, come join the program like ours in which is offered in Tokyo or, or slash Japan that we believe that the, we have a lot to offer by being uh, stationed uh, in Tokyo and then also by being located in Japan. Uh, there are a couple of things here that uh, that's also related to what I mentioned earlier in terms of best of two worlds like East and West uh, that ideas that they w one of the things that we could offer is the uh, cutting edge frontline concepts and frameworks that are being generated in Japan in terms of the management concepts and frameworks. 
So, for example, areas such as knowledge management, which is actually being uh, developed and also being uh, studied probably most extensively in Japan by studying like you know, Japanese companies in you know, Japanese management through the 1980s and the 1990s. And this is sort of like in you know, origin, which is actually studied out of the Hitosubashi University. And our uh, professor emeritus, uh, Ikujiro Nonaka, is one of the founding father uh, of the area. And then also our founding dean of our business school, Hiro Takeuchi. Those are the two uh, founding fathers of the areas of the entire field called knowledge management. Or other fields such as innovation management or operations management, that uh, those areas that what we have accumulated uh, through the studies of the Japanese companies and the Japanese industries, that we have a lot to offer in that field. And then also, because majority of our faculty members have a very uh, intensive and then also extensive network with the Japanese companies in this country. And so including both traditional companies, uh, more established companies like, let's say, Toyota, uh, Sony, Honda, Mitsubishi Corporation or Mitsui uh, Corporation and, and you know, whatnot. But as well as those new, like in emerging companies and industries such as fast retailing Uniqlo uh, business, or like Lawson, which is second biggest uh, convenience store chain in here, or like Muji, or startup companies like Oisix or LifeNet Insurance. You know, those are the companies that we have very uh, strongly, like you know, the uh, tightly knit, knitted uh, relations uh, with uh, with them. And so we have, uh, for example, cases on those companies, and we do invite those, you know, the uh, top managements or founders of those businesses as guest speakers to the classroom. And so we could offer our students and provide our students with the uh, wide range of opportunities for them to directly interact with uh, those, you know, the uh, Japanese companies, uh, managements, or, or also practices. And the last one I want to add here is that there's a lot of happenings, a lot of things happening in the marketplace in Japan. And so a lot of like cultural phenomena or consumption phenomena are also uh, happening in Japan. So, for example, in the different parts of Tokyo, places such as Harajuku, Shibuya and Roppongi's are those are the places that cutting edge phenomena of the, uh, let's say, street fashion or a lot of those pop culture uh, being emerged in those frontline fields of different parts of Tokyo or places such as Akihabara. Those are the mecca of those uh, people who are really into like animation or manga or like, you know, those uh, other pop culture businesses and industries. Or uh, different parts of Tokyo, such as Sugamo, that's the uh, place that the, uh, a lot of like our senior citizens, like an you know, old people getting together and then have fun. And then if you go visit in that part of Tokyo, you see that what's happening in this aging society uh, that uh, probably we are the, um, in a sense, like, you know, a front runner of this aging societies of the uh, developed nations, like a lot of issues, like a lot of countries. Uh, sooner or later is going to face and that, that we are sort of like in a front runner of those issues in, in, in a sense. And so we as a country and then also uh, Japan and also city as Tokyo and a school which is located in that city and then also in that country could actually offer a lot of opportunities for our students to learn through direct experience, hands-on experience with uh, those happenings uh, in this part of the world. And so that's uh, what, what I would probably uh, say in response to your question there. It sounds like an absolutely fascinating uh, place to be. You know, I visited Tokyo once and I everywhere I went, I felt like it was cutting edge everywhere. <laughs> um, just looking <laughs> around, looking at the buildings, you know, it was so amazing. But I'm sure, because I know, I saw on your site that nearly half of your students, even though most of them are international, end up staying in Japan to work. And I wanted to ask you, because I'm sure a common concern is, well, one, what if I don't speak Japanese? 
And two, I've heard that the MBA degree in Japan has been going through, you know, some perception or reputation sort of problems with the corporate community there. So I was wondering if you could talk about those two things, you know, for someone who really wants to be a part of these cutting edge, you know, uh, a force business forces, but, you know, have those concerns. Yeah, um, that's, I mean, great questions, actually. That's the uh, uh, exactly the set of uh, questions we, we ourselves are also asking uh, all the time. Um, the first of all, let me uh, mention, okay, you are correct on that the majority of our students are non-Japanese. And of course, it depends on which year you look at, but they are uh, overall about 80% on average, uh, of our students are coming from outside of Japan, and 20% to 30% of our students are Japanese students. And among those non-Japanese students, about, I would say, two-thirds to close to 75%, maybe three-quarters of our uh, graduating students are staying in Japan and working in Japan. And among those, about half of them are working at Japanese companies. And then the other half are working at non-Japanese companies uh, in their Japanese operations. One of your questions is the Japanese language. The challenge is, is, is a challenge, of course. And then, of course, for obvious reasons, that if you already are uh, fluent in Japanese or if you have... Uh, some level of Japanese uh, proficiency before you start your MBA program or you are building that capability while you're in a program, that's definitely a plus. And, uh, but not all our alumni, the uh, graduates of our MBA program, actually do speak Japanese perfectly, uh, fluently uh, either. So our uh, career services office are helping those non-Japanese students uh, to find a way to get landed in, you know, Japanese business community, either at the Japanese companies or at the non-Japanese companies. So, of course, like, you know, depending on uh, the industries or depending on the position that you're pursuing, that if your position requires you to interact with uh, Japanese customers, customers or Japanese suppliers, that will definitely require you to be fluent and proficient in, in, in Japanese language. But even within the Japanese companies, that if we can find a position that, uh, as you know, that a lot of Japanese companies are currently trying to globalize their business. And so there are chances for you, uh, for our graduates to find a position that language, official language, they are actually being in English rather than in Japanese. And, and, and then it's, it may be even more so in the non-Japanese companies. Like, you know, the, there are, are uh, chances for you to find uh, a position that are uh, primarily function there is to help the local operations to communicate with the uh, headquarters of their businesses. And so, but the other, uh, the opposite is also true too. Like even if you get, even if you're seeking like you know, non-Japanese companies, that if that position actually require you to interact with your local uh, Japanese businesses on day-to-day -day basis, even within that the non-Japanese organizations, that uh, you are required to uh, be fluent in Japanese as well. So we have both, like you know, the cases in terms of where and uh, how our uh, graduates of our MBA program uh, start their career and progresses their career in, in Japan. Okay, yeah, and, and what about the MBA's reputation yes, yes, in yes. Japan? Yes, the overall uh, MBA, that their um, reputation among the Japanese, traditional Japanese companies is exactly what you described earlier. But that's being changing uh, at the same time, especially among uh, those, I would say, new and upcoming or uh, new and emerging or growing Japanese companies. And so we find 
sort of like, you know, both two sort of like different sets of phenomena are, are ongoing in parallel, I mean, and simultaneously. That while we are still seeing uh, that a lot of like uh, those traditional Japanese companies ha are still continuing to see like, you know, the MBA degree, not that much of value. But at the same time that uh, we uh, get growing number of Japanese companies attending our open campus events, especially in these couple of years, while a lot of Japanese companies seeking the uh, growth opportunities outside of Japan. And so I kind of like, you know, uh, see sort of like a, those two things happening at the same time uh, at this point. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that clarification. And and just one more question on the program. I know that ICS stands for International Corporate Strategy, but I also saw that some students also believe that means I can't sleep. <laughs> and I, I know that yeah. uh, your program has this flexibility to be either one or two years, That's which right. I felt was quite unusual. So could you just uh, talk a little bit more about you know why someone would do one year versus two years and, and the workload as well? Sure. Yes, I, uh, uh, we are uh, well aware of that. The ICS and its students are sort of like as part of their parody and joking that the ICS actually stands for I Cannot Sleep. And that's uh, probably is uh, all about like you know, how intensive and then how demanding the program is, especially in the first term, the term one. This is where that there are a lot of students are taking all the required core courses and uh, they are staying in the same classroom uh, with the same group uh, of uh, students uh, together all the time and I try to survive through this, you know, the term one, uh, you know, the course, course workload. And back to your question, uh, yes, uh, we offer two programs that are for the students to choose from, two-year program and one-year program. Um, Two-year program students and one-year program students, and they are actually taking uh, courses together. So, and we are uh, using this class system uh, with the entering class. So we call our students by, you know, which year that they enter our program. That's partly because of the fact that we run these two programs at the same time. So that students are graduating in different years, depending on which program they belong to. And once they enter, for example, this incoming class of 2013, which is the uh, group of students who are going to start the MBA program in September this year. While they are in the program, uh, they are taking uh, courses together. So if you come visit our campus and then if you have a chance to sit in, in on any of our classes, uh, probably you cannot really tell uh, which students are in one-year program, which students are in two-year program. And so they're going through the same coursework. But the key difference between a two-year program and a one-year program is in the second year of the two-year program. The two-year program uh, students going through in their first year in the same way as the uh, one-year program students go through. But in the second year, they have the option of going on doing, now I'm going to explain a little detail later on, uh, what we call the double degree program in the second year, uh, or exchange program with 12 different partner business schools that we have around the world. Or uh, they could also engage themselves in full-time internship program, if they so choose. Or they can combine those programs at a different time of the second year. And, and in the first year, um, uh, uh, in a one-year program, uh, they do not have that option in the, in the second year, of course. And so two-year program is more for those students who are interested in shifting their gear in their career before and then after their MBA program education. So this, if the students are interested in changing, let's say, industry, 
or um, function in the same industry or change in the company. That two-year program is actually is more for them so that they could use their second year to uh, try out different internship programs. Or maybe even like, you know, they are trying out the different locations of the world, let's say, uh, like kind of pursuing their career in a different parts of the world so that they could go on the exchange program in a different parts of the world or pursuing this double degree program. And a one-year program is more for those uh, students who already have some pretty clear idea of what they want to do after they finish an MBA program so that they do not really need to do, spend the entire year to explore and experiment different, you know, the kinds of industries and different functions, uh, different companies or different regions uh, in, in the second year. So they could focus on more on the coursework and uh, in, in their first year. And, and I imagine most of the international students uh, opt for the two-year program? Yeah, and, but we also do have uh, a lot of uh, international students' one-year program as well. Interesting. Wow. So they must really have a pretty good grasp of what they want to do. Okay, we're going to take this to a part two where Professor Yoshi and I talk about admissions, financing, and careers uh, at the Hitotsubashi ICS MBA program. Stay tuned.